Welcome to Behind the Scenes, making an intranasal vaccine. In this episode, we are going to Dublin, Ireland. We are meeting with Professor Ed Lavelle. He is a world expert immunologist and professor in immunology in the School of Biochemistry and Immunology at Trinity College, Dublin. Professor Lavelle has specialized in mucosal vaccination and published over 155 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals why the world could benefit from a nasal vaccine. So in terms of, of COVID, the ideal vaccine would be a transmission blocking vaccine. So you'd think, and the most effective way to block transmission would be to have mucosal immune responses at the site of infection. Because if you can stop the virus getting into epithelial cells at the beginning and replicating, then you cur curtail the entire process. And doing that with an injectable vaccine is probably going to be not the most effective approach. A really effective mucosal local vaccine that can uh, block, fully block trans infection and thereby transmission would be the ideal vaccine. What would be the advantage of a mucosal immunization route versus a traditional intramuscular injection in terms of efficacy of a vaccine? The major advantage is the vast majority of the dangerous pathogens that humans have to deal with are encountered at mucosal surfaces. So either in the intestine through contaminated food or water or in the respiratory tract through, through pathogens that you take in through breathing. So the natural immune response against those infections is a response at the mucosal surfaces themselves. So either antibody responses like IgA or T cell responses in the, in the tissue. And they can very effectively pr uh, protect you against against infection, whereas when you give vaccines by, by needle or by the injectable route, you tend to get very strong immune responses systemically, like in the blood and in the internal uh, tissues like the spleen, but weaker responses at mucosal sites. So that, can, that can prevent disease and serious uh, consequences of the infections, but generally doesn't stop the infection itself. So probably the major advantage of, a, of an effective mucosal vaccine would be blocking infection rather than just disease. Is it more difficult to make a mucosal vaccine relative to a traditional intramuscular vaccine? Uh, overall, it, it, it is. Well, probably because vaccine development historically has focused on, with the, with the exception of a couple of vaccines like the oral polio vaccine, all the, other, the majority of other vaccines we have are injectable vaccines. And one of the attractions with an injectable vaccine is you can, def you can refine your formulation in a very specific way and when you inject it through the needle, it's delivered in exactly that format into the body. Whereas at a mucosal site, whether orally or nasally, you have less control over what happens to the vaccine after administration than you have by injection, which means you can't take exactly the same approach. And you have to take factors into account like degradation of the antigen, for example, in the intestinal tract, uh, dilution of the antigen after administration, especially in the gut, but also in the nose. And then the fact that uh, mucosal sites are naturally highly regulated, so you don't get excessive responses to, to antigens that aren't dangerous. So you can't assume that something you make for injectable delivery will work by mucosal sites. So I think you have to take a, a very specific approach for making a mucosal vaccine compared to an injectable vaccine. And I think as a result, historically, a lot of vaccine developers kept away from it because they saw the challenges as being too great. I think it's that increasingly now we're aware that there's huge benefits of mucosal vaccination, which make overcoming those challenges worth worth the effort. Uh, what, what do you think about the intranasal route? Is that, uh, again, different from the oral route? Well, the, I mean, there's clearly advantages to the nasal route because we know that many of the dangerous pathogens we deal with, whether it's, it's SARS-CoV-2 or flu or many bacterial pathogens, we encounter them through uh, the upper respiratory tract. And we know that immune responses against those pathogens at the site of infection, whether it's by their antibody responses. Like in the upper respiratory tract, it can be IgA or IgG, and also uh, T cell responses in the tissues can mediate protection. So clearly, that, so biologically, it makes a lot of sense. Secondly, the other advantage of nasal over oral is you don't have to deal with the highly proteolytic environment. So if you consume something orally, you have a very low pH in the stomach, you've got very high concentrations of proteases. So you clearly have challenges in the nose, but you don't have to deal with those specific degradative challenges that you have in the case of uh, oral delivery. And as well as that, historically it was seen that similar formulations given in the nose, at least in, in, in rodent models, it was easier to trigger strong immune responses. 
uh, by the nasal route than by the oral route. I think over the years we've realised that that depends very much on the nature of the of the formulation. It's probably not, not universally true, but yeah, if you're comparing nasal and oral, there are logistical reasons why you go for nasal over oral, particularly if the infection you're trying to deal with is an infection of the respiratory tract. I think the dogma would be you're better to vaccinate where you're li more likely to encounter the infection because generally, even, even though different mucosal tissues are connected and you can induce immune responses at a distant site, uh, in general, you get the strongest response at, uh, response at the site where you actually administer the vaccine. Uh, in the Netherlands, many patients who now receive the COVID vaccine uh, seem to not respond to the vaccine in terms of antibody response generation. Um, those are so-called non-responders. Uh, as a result of this immunosuppressive treatment that these people get, they are um, autoimmune patients or cancer patients. Would uh, mucosal immunization, in this case nasal immunization with the COVID vaccine, uh, bring some level of uh, immunity at the, at the port of entry of the virus? Um, which uh, may help these patients to, um, to, to be protected at a certain level at least uh, through the non-specific immune system. Yeah, it's possible. I think we don't know enough for the moment in terms of with specific uh, chemotherapy or specific immunosuppressive drugs exactly what impact they have on specific aspects of the mucosal immune system. So are you getting the same degree of immunosuppression on B and T cells or on dendritic cells or macrophages in the upper respiratory tract as you are systemically. I think without knowing that it's difficult to know. I think if we had that information on in, the, in relation to specific drugs, if we find that the degree of immunosuppression is less at the mucosal sites than systemically, then potentially mucosal vaccination might be more effective than systemic vaccination. Or if you have induced a limited response by injection, a mucosal booster might be able to amplify that response or bring the response to the mucosal tissues. In terms of non-specific innate defense, I think again it would depend on whether the immunosuppressive uh, drugs are targeting the innate immune system or the adaptive immune system. If they're mainly, mainly targeting the adaptive system, there could be a largely intact innate immune system that could potentially respond then to a, a stimulatory mucosal treatment that could boost innate antiviral uh, responses. Given all these advantages, isn't it surprising that for COVID, which is a respiratory uh, disease, uh, there are so few intranasal approaches. Uh, if you look at the, at the scala of vaccines that now are in development. Yeah, it, it, it is not surprising because the challenge at the beginning of the pandemic was to make vaccines quickly and so we mobilized very new technologies that were amenable to more rapid uh, development and because we haven't historically been uh, so successful at making mucosal vaccines to take that path at the beginning would have delayed the process. I think now people are realizing there's probably very significant advantages of mucosal approaches to block transmission of the infection. So I think you'd hopefully see in the coming year much more happening on, in terms of nasal vaccines than injectable vaccines. What, what do you think about the vaccine which is developed by Intravac, the AVAC-10, which is a non-genetic vaccine, a non-replicating vaccine, non-vector based, but just a particle with uh, the spike protein as a subunit on it attached? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting approach. We, we know that outer membrane vesicles uh, are very effective uh, vaccines in other contexts or components of vaccines for other infectious diseases like meningitis. So um, that's a good part, place to start. And we know that uh, for mucosal vaccination, having something that's in particular form, like a, a virus-like particle or an outer membrane vesicle or a killed bacterium is more immunogenic than a, than a purified protein. So that, that's uh, beneficial in terms of immune activation because you have bacterial factors in the OMVs and you have antigens expressed in a form that's better for B-cell activation. So I think it's an interesting approach and certainly what we've learned from COVID is you can't afford to go with one approach, you need multiple different approaches. It's difficult to tell at this point which nasal vaccine will be more, more effective, so I think taking every approach simultaneously is the best way to go. Thank you for watching this first video of the series Behind the Scenes, Making an Intranasal Vaccine. Please join us the next time when we continue this series. Ooh.